I only had a day and a half. Is that too loud? It's really ringing in my ears. Anyway, I only had a day and a half, which is not very much time in Barcelona, which is an amazing city for architecture, if you're interested in architecture. So I got into this space as early as I could in the morning. And the idea was I would spend a couple of hours here and then move on and do other things. But once I got into this cathedral, and many of you will recognize this as Gaudi's La Sagrada Familia, as soon as I got into this space, the crowds sort of receded and time slowed down. And instead of two hours, I spent the entire day there. I didn't leave until it closed. And during that time, I had a lot of different experiences. I experienced joy, I experienced wonder, I experienced awe, I experienced delight. And the question, the question I would pose to you is how is it possible, how is it possible that this built, constructed, artificial environment could produce these kinds of emotions in me? And in the next 12 or so minutes, what I would like you to do is to think about this question the way a neuroscientist would. I want to be very clear about one thing. A neuroscientist like me has very little to say about architecture per se, but what we might have something to say about is the experience of architecture, because that's a human response, and we might have something to say about that. This structure, as many of you know, is about 150 years in the making and is still a work in progress. We are, after all, in Italy. 150 years is a blink of an eye here. So we can go much further back into the past, and the architects here will all know this, which is you can go back 2,000 years and you get to Vitruvius, who wrote a 10-volume treatise on architecture. And in this treatise, he emphasized three things that apply to all built environments, built structures, which is that one needed to consider the structural integrity of, uh, of a building, its vermitas, one considered its utility, its uh, functionality, utilitas, and then one also considered the beauty and aesthetics of a building, its venustas, and this is sometimes referred to as the Vitruvian triad, and as someone who is interested in aesthetics, you can take the aesthetics node of this triad and explode it into another triad of how you might think about brain systems that are involved in this. And so we have talked about the way in which emotions are engaged uh, in aesthetic experiences, the way in which knowledge and meaning is brought to bear, and the way the design of our sensory and motor systems might have something to do with aesthetic experiences, that experiences are an emergent property out of these large-scale systems. Now, I want to be clear that it is possible, if you look at the functionality of buildings, that there can be such a tight link between form and function in some buildings, like this example of an industrial building, that that can have its own sort of beauty. But I would suggest to you that we think about function in a slightly different way, which is we think about the function of a building as a way to modulate human experience, as a way in which the environment, the built environment, is having a conversation with the person in, the, in this space, and at its best, a way in which this space enhances human flourishing. So going back to the aesthetic triad, 
one can now think about, if one is thinking about emotions and valuation, one can ask, is this space, is the experience of this space having an effect on our reward systems? Do we experience pleasure? Or is it something that taps into systems that are designed to experience disgust? And do we feel repulsed by the space? We can talk about knowledge and meaning. This is where people's personal experiences, their personal histories, their cultural experiences come to bear. This is also where the knowledge, the knowledge of master architects, their insights, their intuitions, their deep understanding of how space affects people comes to bear. And then you can think about the way in which our sensory systems are designed uh, and, uh, and affects our experience uh, of these kinds of spaces. So those who are of us who are non-architects, more often than not, think of architecture in visual terms. But we know that the way space is constructed, it's a multimodal construct. It is not primarily or only visual. So you can ask about, what about the acoustics of the space, our auditory system? What about the smell, the olfactory system? What about the tactile, the touch of that space? And how does the space engage our motor systems? So it could be that some spaces feel dynamic. You feel a sense of movement. You feel like you want to ascend up the space. And there might be other spaces that slow you down, that make you feel still. So with these are the kinds of questions and the kinds of topics that neuroscientists might ask. And what I'm going to next show you is a set of experiments we did. And the challenge, this is a challenge that is true for all science, but has a particular nature, a particular form of challenge in this domain. The challenge in science is always, how do you take something that is quite complex and reduce it into meaningful units? And in this case, it's a double challenge, because you have a space, a constructed space, which itself is a complicated construct. How do you reduce that into meaningful units? And on the other hand, you've got the human mind and brain, which is also tremendously complex. And how do you reduce that into meaningful units? And what I'm going to show you is our attempts uh, to do exactly that. So we took 200 images of interiors. These were picked by Danish architects. And we decided we were only going to look at three elemental properties of these interiors that apply to all interiors, which is they have high ceilings or low ceilings, are they rectilinear or curvilinear, and are they open or closed? And in this sense, open means you can see past, you can see past the enclosure. Then we looked at 16 psychological dimensions, and these are dimensions that were culled from the literature when people have looked at uh, psychological responses to either natural landscapes or the built environments. And so we had these 16 dimensions. We took 800 people and had them rate each of these images on these 16 dimensions. Once you do that, you can create a correlation matrix. And this is what you get, which is it shows you the way in which these concepts are related to each other from 800 people rating these 200 images on these dimensions. So we then use two analytic techniques. And here again, the idea is how do we reduce this complexity into meaningful, tractable units? And the first is something called semantic network analysis. And when we do that, this is what we get. And what this shows is the relationship of each of these concepts to the others. And what we find is that the responses reduce to three broad clusters. One that we're calling coherence, which is how organized is the space? How, how does it feel uh, with respect to its structure and organization? The second is fascination. 
you feel intrigued by the space? Do you want to explore it? Do you want to enter it? And the third is something we're calling hominess. Does it make you feel relaxed? Do you feel at home in that space? And interestingly, right at the center of this is valence. Valence is the, the most basic question, does this make you feel good or not? seems to be right in the middle of these three clusters in this network analysis. Then we use another technique called principal component analysis. Use the same, look at the same responses and um, do that. And again, we end up with the same three principal components, which is that there is a component of coherence, a component of fascination, and a component of hominess. Now what this allows us to do in this analysis that you can't do with semantic network analysis is to say that of these 800 people looking at 200 images, 90% of the variance, which means that there's 90% agreement that this is the structure of how people are responding to these environments. So we're armed with this information in two different ways of looking at it. And we actually did a replication study and find the same thing to feel that this must be something important about these three constructs. And then the final piece of the puzzle is if that is the case, is there something about our brains that are hardwired to respond to these constructs? Right? That's a, the final piece of this set of questions. Now, it turned out that five years ago, and 3,000 miles away from where we did this, right, this was done in Philadelphia, five years ago, we had done an imaging study using participants in the Canary Islands, where they looked at exactly these same images, and they were making two judgments. Do they think this is beautiful? Is this a space they feel like they would want to enter? At the time, we didn't even know about these components. So we go back to their data, go back to their data from five years ago, armed with this new information of these three components and remodel their data. The question being, is our brain, their brains, responsive to these components? And what we find is, yes, that within occipital cortex, this is the back of the brain, our visual cortex, that you have different parts of the brain, and I can give you the complicated names if you want, but there are different parts of the brain that are responsive to fascination, to hominess, and to coherence, suggesting that these really are hardwired in our brain, and this is something we didn't even know about when we actually did these studies, and the people were not being asked questions about any of these components. So it's an example, I think, of the way in which neuroscience might be able to give you some traction on hidden responses to the environment that we don't even know is going on. And to remind you, from our semantic network analysis, right in the center of all of these is this most basic notion of well-being, which is, does this make you feel good or make you feel bad? So I'm going to end with a quote from a famous architect, famous American architect, Louis Kahn. This is my office building. This is designed by him. And I'm going to read what Louis Kahn says. He says, a great building must begin with the immeasurable, it must go through measurable means when it is being designed, and in the end must be unmeasured. Our challenge as scientists is precisely that we have to measure the response to the unmeasured.